Gospel of Matthew. It's a familiar to many of us. Uh, this is Jesus uh, just in really the days before his death, in, having entered Jerusalem and uh, coming into the temple and finding it uh, there, people not praying in the temple, people not sacrificing, but uh, changing money instead. And here is, here is how Jesus responds. Ellie, will you read that scripture? Yes. The word of God says, Jesus entered the temple court and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you. They say uh, that art, especially great art, but uh, but art, the, the purpose of it, whether it's music or painting or or dance is to communicate uh, great ideas and emotions. That's the purpose of art, and sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes it's it's ugly, but always the purpose to convey ideas and emotions. And that is certainly what uh, uh, no one was better at that than the great artist from 350 years ago, the Dutch artist Rembrandt. You will find him at the top of many, many people's lists of greatest artists of all time, and he was prolific. He did lots and lots of of art, and he was wonderful at doing this, at conveying emotion through his art, but also conveying great ideas. And that is something I want to tell you about one of his pieces in particular. Today it hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and it's a depiction of the scripture that Ellie just read for us, Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple. And there's something that you would, you would notice right away. And in fact, people have noticed for the last 350 years, and they've commented upon, and there have been debate about it. Not only is art, uh, experts in art look at this, but also theologians look at it and talk about it and think about it. It's a strange little aspect of this that we see the great emotion there. We see the fear of the money changers as they're cowering away. We see the tables overturned and the people in the distance kind of running away as the beautiful pillars of the temple are there uh, surrounding them all. And the expression in Jesus' face, his anger. That's always one thing I appreciate about this story. It shows us that anger is not a sin. Anger is not a sin. It's, it's, it's a, when we use our anger for negative things. God wants us to be angry, right? About certain things. And here was one thing that Jesus became angry about, and we see that in his face. But then we see the strange aspect of this uh, depiction. Uh, Jesus is holding a whip in his hand, as is mentioned in other versions of the story other than we read today. He's holding a whip to threaten uh, the money changers and drive them out with it. And um, as you would expect in a, a painting of this period, there is a halo there in the picture. And we're used to seeing in these old pictures halos around the heads of those uh, sacred people. It helped you when you were looking at a picture to identify who was who, to see who the holy people were. And certainly the Son of God, we would expect Jesus to have a halo. And it's there, but it's not around his head. The halo is around his hand. The hand that he's using to do his work there. The hand he's using to do God's work in that moment. A halo, not around the head, but around the hand. I don't know any other piece of art from this period or any other where the halo is not around the person's head. And, and that makes sense to us. That, that's a good, certainly a good place to have it. People debated why this was. Why would Rembrandt of all people, who was so meticulous, so experienced, make this mistake? And the one, one claim is that, oh, well, it's because he was a Protestant. And Protestants don't understand, like Roman Catholic artists would, about the halos would go around the head. So it's because he was a Protestant. He didn't know where to put it. But then they, the Roman Catholics had invented the halo, and they knew where it was would go, so he had put it around the hand instead of the head as in state. 
And then there are other people that say, oh no, what a mistake. Remember, a great artist to communicate emotions, which he does in his painting, emotions of all the people are there to see, but also great ideas. Artists can convey great ideas, and they say, this is a great idea that he is conveying by putting the halo around the hand, because we, what is most sacred in this world? And what about ourselves is most sacred? And then certainly, we would not blame anyone for putting the halo around the head. In fact, that's where I would tend to put it, what I think, what I consider. I spend a lot of time thinking and thinking about sermons and thinking about uh, funerals and thinking about all the things that need to be done. Thinking is so important. It is the cradle of everything else that we do. So certainly, putting the halo around the head would be uh, appropriate. Uh, the hand is the actor, the head is the director, telling the actor what to do. Without the head, nothing else would get done. So yes, we may want to put the, the halo there. And some of us, though, would want to put it more around uh, our mouths, our tongues, because that's uh, it's so important what we say. Yes, it's in our head, we think something, but then we say it. And what an impact it has. Nobody knows that better than myself after this week, have someone coming and offering their sympathy. It's just going to be such a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. And it's so helpful and so uplifting. And we can choose to do that. Our words have such power. Think about the music that we get that we're blessed to hear each week. And yes, the music is wonderful. But we get also get the opportunity, because of Linda, to look at the words to the music and how uplifting uh, they are. Uh, how wonderful it is to see these expressions of God's love. Our words are very important, absolutely. And we can do great things with them, and we can tear people down with them. And we can use our voices in an ugly way as well. And so we recognize how sacred our words can be. And so yes, we put it around, yeah, around our head, the kind of the mouth area to, to recognize how important our words were, but not the head, not the mouth. Rembrandt put the halo around the hand. And maybe that's where the halo really should be. For as good as it is to think wonderful thoughts and uh, big ideas and make plans in our head for, for the future and, and to think about how much God loves us and to think about uh, uh, all that we have, all that we have to be grateful for. That is wonderful. As wonderful it is to speak that and say it, and say what we like and what we don't like, and, and all of the things that we uh, uh, can say to make people's lives better. That is great, and it brings us great joy and satisfaction. But nothing, nothing in this world brings joy and satisfaction the way doing something does. It is amazing how actually getting down and actually an action to follow our thoughts, to follow our words, to follow those with something that's actually going to make a difference in this world. I experienced that today. So many wonderful outpourings in different ways from people uh, this week to, to, to our family. And, uh, to me, as we had, I was involved in three funerals this week, one of which was my mother three different funerals, a very hectic week, and, and uh, 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 Carol Pass uh, agreed to uh, and volunteered to teach Sunday school for me, which I would have done today to teach Carol Sunday school. And I'll tell you, that is amazing to see that. It's always wonderful to have know that people are thinking and praying for us. It's always wonderful when people say something, but then when that goes into action, and someone actually does something, what a blessing that is. And it's so, it's a blessing especially because we don't always have the chance to do that, do we? We want to help. We want to do something. But what do we do? And then every once in a while, that opportunity will pop its head. And we'll see that, oh gosh, not only can I think about someone and pray about someone, but here's a chance for me to do something. Yes, our Minds are important, our thoughts are important, that's where it all begins, and our mouths can bring such great blessings, our words, but then finally to be able to bring our actions. It can bring us such a great satisfaction, and it's true with our faith as well. With our faith, we can think about our faith. 
We can think about God's love. We can, we can talk about it, which we do. Boy, we are good talkers, and we have to be. I mean, that's, that's what it is to be a minister, and especially a preacher. You've got to talk. You've got to say things. You've got to think about it beforehand, hopefully, before you start talking about it. And then you say things. We, are, we do that of great here at the church. There are all sorts of words that we say, that we write down. We have our newsletter and our emails. We have texts, and we have all sorts of different ways that we can send our words out today to other people. And that is great, too, to express our faith through our words. But then finally it comes down to being willing to express that faith through some kind of action. And, you know, Jesus talked to his disciples about this. He did it throughout his ministry. But the one time in particular I'm remembering today is when Jesus was with the apostle Peter and the other apostles after his resurrection. He was having this wonderful moment with them on a, on a beach, actually, the beach of uh, the Sea of Galilee. And they were sitting there together, the risen Christ, and they had recognized him. And Jesus uh, turns to Peter, you know, who had been there since the very beginning. I mean, he was the kind of guy who was there when the lights turned on in the morning, and he was there until they were turned off at night. He was in. He had given his presence to Jesus Christ. He had had that difficult moment when he denied Christ three times uh, when Jesus was on trial. And, uh, but now he's sitting with Christ and he had been with him for three years. And Jesus asked him a question that must have been uh, a little hurtful to Peter because that you know, maybe made sense in light of his denial. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Again, Seems like it'd be obvious. Peter had been there. Peter had given Christ the gift of his presence. Peter had done all these things. He had stepped out on the boat, out of the boat, tried to walk on the water. He had been the first to make the great confession that Jesus was the Son of God. All these things he had talked about, all these things he had been present for. But then finally Jesus asked him, Do you love me? And Peter said, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said something that took the halo right down to the hand. He said, four words, then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Take this general commitment that you have to me, this presence that you have given me. It's wonderful you're present here, but do something to show your commitment. It's easy to be uh, on board with things in general, the faith, life, I mean, with the church. There are a lot of people who are on board. They, they love the church. They love the fact that they're in their community. There are many, many churches, and they because they know the churches do good things. Churches make communities stronger. They are all for the church in general, but they do not join one church specifically. They do not give their commitment to that one church. There are those who make a commitment to one church, but then do not make a commitment of giving of themselves, their, their time and their talents, and certainly their money as well. To make that commitment, to take that step from not just thinking about it, not just talking about it, but doing this holy thing of putting it actually into action. We have one chance to do that next week as we come here to our service, a time of commitment to write down how much we plan to give next year to let the uh, the folks here know so that we can plan out a budget for next year to make a commitment in our own hearts. And it's not unusual. We come here quite a lot to make commitments, don't we? Uh, when actually some folks here came down here to this church, came down front and, and made their confession of faith, just as Peter did that first time. And when we do that, when our young people come, and older folks come down to make their confession of faith, and I ask them, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? We're asking for a commitment. To say, yes, I am a follower of Christ. I am committed to that. When couples come here to be married, and they move from many of them, most of them now move from simply living together to being married. What is the difference? Well, they have made a commitment. They have moved. Now, 
from, from being, uh, not being committed before God, and not making promises, to have made promises, and then their actions from that are going to flow, their faithfulness, their sacrifice for one another, to flow from those commitments that they have made. One of my favorite times is when we bring babies here to dedicate. And I didn't know if you all knew this, but we actually have two kind of baby dedications here. I don't think anybody actually knew this till, till now. Uh, there's two kinds, and I always figure out which kind it's going to be, because there are times when people uh, want their children dedicated here because this is where their grandparents went to church. And so they bring their children, and they know, because they actually don't even live here in town, this, this child is never going to come back here again. They're never going to be here again. They're, uh, they're never going to, uh, the parents are never going to work it within the, education within the Sunday school. That's not going to happen to these kids. This is the last time we're going to see them. We're going to show everybody that it's going to be wonderful, and we're going to ask for a blessing for that child, which is great. That's a baby dedication. We're asking for a blessing, but that's not what we have normally done throughout the years. What we do here, when we can, the holy thing we do is we bring a child forward and we bless them, yes, but we also ask for a commitment we ask the congregation, will you do your part in taking care of this child, in helping them grow, in teaching them about Jesus Christ, in being good examples of what Christ is and who Christ is and how Christ can change us and make us love one another and treat each other with love and respect. Will you do that? And we as a congregation commit to that child and to that family. And then we ask the parents, do you commit to do your part in bringing your child closer and helping them to understand Jesus Christ by coming here and by supporting what we do here with them and by, uh, uh, by teaching them yourself about Christ's love? Do you make that commitment? And they say, yes, they do. This wonderful moment of commitment where words, thoughts, and then words become actions because we have committed ourselves to them. We'll have our chance to do that next week with our finances with friends. That's just the tip of the iceberg. You may not be here next week. It doesn't matter. For you have that opportunity every day to take all of your best thoughts about God and about Jesus and what Jesus wants for us each and every day, what God hopes we will do, and how we can bring glory to God, and all of this is in your head, and you talk about it, maybe to yourself, maybe to God in prayer, maybe to your friends, maybe here in church, like me, spouting off about what you believe about God, and telling others what you believe about God, but then there is going to come that moment when you will find somebody who either literally or figuratively needs a hand. They need a hand up, and you will reach out to them, if you so choose, to lift them up, to help them along the way, to give them, if they need it, the forgiveness that they are asking for. And as you do this, as you determine to reach out your hand to them and turn your thoughts and your words into actions, do not be surprised if even just for the slightest moment, you see a halo there around your hand. It's about prayer. Loving God, we do give thanks that we can think about you, that we can think about your incredible love as shown throughout the Bible, but we see it, Lord, particularly in your son Jesus, in all that he brought us and all that he did for us. Loving God, thank you for giving us the chance to be warned by the thoughts of your great love for us. And Lord, thank you for giving us the chance to be able to fellowship with one another, to learn and to talk about that great love, to communicate these great ideas to each other, to tell each other what is important to us about our faith. Lord, thank you for that chance. But Lord, most of all, thank you for the opportunity, opportunity you give us to show it through our actions, to do things that bring glory to your name. Lord, we know that though one person may preach the sermon, though 
one person may click the computer and four, five, six may play in the band. We all can participate here in this moment of communion. This is our chance to reach out, to take hold of the bread, 